Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. A really exciting episode today. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm joined with Anabolic Gab. Gab, how are you? How did you sleep? Uh, I'm first. I'm really excited for this episode. Mm. I'm really good. Slept okay. Been watching the uh, the new Stranger Things and just got the wisdom teeth out. So sleeping, you know, just like absolutely knocked out. Mm. And um, but we get it done. What about yourself? And how did you sleep? I'm very well, thanks. I slept very well. Uh, your wisdom teeth procedure has been sublime. Like it's been incredible. Really good. Yeah. Touch wood. Like no pain whatsoever. I just like can't open my mouth too heavily. It's been absolutely smashing grandma's anabolic chicken soup just the compressed nutrients in there bit of ramen bit of minestrone i'm not much of a soup man but at the moment i am you know um i think it's really important just to keep those nutrients in during this time otherwise your recovery will probably be um suboptimal absolutely well you're looking good mate good job now we've got i i'm just (coughs) gonna call it here this has the potential to be one of our best podcasts Mm -hmm. i'd say top three best podcasts because we're bloody excited we've got the i'd say one of the biggest hustlers in the industry coach huey Nice to meet you guys. Thank you very much for having us on. Thank you very much for coming on. How are you? How did you sleep? I slept very well, tracked it. Um, Basically two hours of REM, about two hours of deep sleep. Had about, I think it was 40 minutes awake and then about two hours of light sleep. So it was okay. How do you go about tracking that? Uh, Basically we use an Apple Watch. So oh, okay. basically, we got the Apple Watch. There's an app called Pillow. Yeah. You do have to pay for the um, premium subscription, but basically, I get all my athletes to pretty much download this. Whoever yeah. do have an Apple Watch, and we always track it on the sleep. It's yeah. important. It's vital. Oh, that's good. As I'm more yeah. of a sleep cycle man myself. Yeah, that I sounds see, like a good one. You know what? You got me into it. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, once I started seeing you track it and posting on your story, it's I was so like, important, isn't it? I always say this to my athletes that I'd rather them sacrifice a training session or sacrifice a meal over their sleep. Mm-hmm. For me, if the sleep is foundational. Yep. You know what I mean? If you have a bad sleep, you make bad decisions, you just, you know what I mean? The day is, as you said, not so, not optimal. And I think if you're tracking that sleep, you can definitely like pinpoint when your performance or mood or just other things are going down when your sleep is just in the toilet. So It's a good start, team. That's the best answer we've had yeah. to the sleep question. <laughs> uh, you're at the fight today. Who, who was fighting again? You're at so, Marvel Stadium. Yeah, so Devin Haney and George Kambosis. Um, interesting fight. I did before tip Haney to win. Mm. Um, Haney just had a dominant performance. And from my opinion, I believe a lot of that just came from his focus. Um, mm. George did do a lot of trash talking prior. Yeah. And I do believe that that sort of hurt his performance in a way where his mind wasn't on it. You know what, what I mean? What do you think of like the tra- trash talking and stuff in boxing? I think it has its place. Um, look at Mike Tyson, you know what I mean? The best at the art of intimidation. He, you know, won fights before they even started based on that intimidation mm. factor. However, I think let your work do the talking. Mm. You know what I mean? I think you can have a it's bit of... It's got to be justified. Exactly. And confidence and that ability to trash talk, it comes from reference points. Yep. If you know you've done the work, you know you've done your strength and conditioning correctly, you've done your skills work right, then by all means, trash talk. But usually the best fighters I see, they don't need to because mm. they know their abilities and they don't have to have that extra factor to go on. Mm. Now, you're talking to two absolute martial art kind of things. <laughs> I'm speaking for you. I, I don't know much at all. Um, so this was boxing, was it? wasn't boxing. UFC. It was, boxing. Yeah, boxing, so boxing. Very yes, different, yes very different. So obviously there's the MMA side, there's boxing, jiu-jitsu. So yeah. I currently train out a UFC gym, Rockdale in Sydney. And, yeah. you know, we get a whole class of athletes all from MMA. I've actually currently training a few boys for the International MMA Federation. Mm. So we've got a fight coming up in five weeks, which is very exciting. Yep. So it'll be good to see how we go with that. Huge. Kick their head in. <laughs> Do it faster than <laughs> the other bloke. That's was, it. Was exactly. Prime Train a good fighter? Prime Train was, look, I'm going to give him absolute credit. Shit ass. <laughs> <laughs> Shit ass. Look, There's a reason I, he's a diver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, I will give him credit. Not many people will jump into the ring. Oh, mate. Do you so know what I mean? This is fucking... Look at him. He's like um, Mike Tyson. Myself, I'm not a boxer. I do more specializing towards like the grappling side of it. Um, however, yeah. No, he, look, he was a good fighter and it was a great experience. Hopefully, we can have a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> I might, might do like a two-on-two. Oh, man. Yeah, 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 me and Lou against Gavin <laughs> Tom, eh? We're lovers, not fighters, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We are, we are not yeah. fighters. Now, for, for, for listeners um, who haven't heard of you, yeah. uh, which is weird if you're listening to this because I'm sure they have, mm. could you give us a brief synopsis on yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Definitely. So my name is Coach Huey. I'm an accredited exercise physiologist who graduated out of Sydney, Sydney University. Um, whilst my time was there, I was offered an exclusive internship to coach the Sydney Uni Football Club. Mm. So basically the rugby Colts team. And that was about 
We had about 75 to 100 players that were coaching from Div 1 up to Div 4. Mm. So that was a fantastic experience before moving into operate, opening my own business called Affinity Athletics. Um, so essentially, yeah, we basically just specialize in rugby union, rugby league, combat sports, but we also take on soccer, AFL, etc. And essentially what we try to do is provide our clients with the safest, most efficient and healthiest way of achieving their goals. Mm. Mm. It's a, mate, it's a clinical operation you're running down there. It's, Definitely. it's so cool to see. How did you get started on the social media thing? Because obviously that's how we found out about you and, and heard about you. It's a very good question. So basically last year I knew that I needed to start my social media as I was graduating in July. So I started in, I believe, May last year. And I, that's when I started my internship with Rugby Union for the Sydney Uni. So basically I started filming just whilst I was training with the boys, I was like, I might as well flip out my phone and record the training that we're doing. And I wanted to show case to everyone what we're actually doing at the university. And then since then we pretty much blew up. So mm -hmm. I had um, two videos that I posted on TikTok, which both gained me over a hundred thousand followers each. Mm -hmm. um, so That's that really, handy. yeah, that really Must built. Be nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll do it soon. <laughs> Hopefully this can get there. Yeah, um, this will be it. Yeah, exactly. So basically those two videos really just, you know, skyrocketed the momentum and then from there we just kept building up on that um we are looking to expand into youtube and snapchat soon i know those are really great platforms mm. um i've seen you guys been doing it a lot especially with snapchat yeah. i think it builds a really nice community um but overall our goal when it comes to social media is just providing valuable content mm. stuff that people can see and they know this is evidence-informed practice it's not opinionated it's fact-based yeah you know what i mean and it's like I find that's where I see a little bit of lacking in the social media game at, at the moment. I know me personally, I always struggle with finding credible information and knowing is this the right thing to do or not. Mm. It's hugely refreshing seeing your content because mm. mm. it is, it is so fact-checked fact and, and all of the above. Have you ever had any issues with hate or you know people being pricks? I'd, I'd love to hear your outlook on it. I think you always will find hate whenever you're sort of reaching towards your limits um if you're getting in sort of that uncomfortable zone you're always going to find haters um i'm not really faced from it to be honest um as i said i just find that people who take their time to provide that negativity it's not really worth my time to really care about so much mm. but yeah there's always going to be haters in this world yeah do you find the hate comes from people who are accredited as well or, or they're, they're just like they're just you know, pissed not, off and not really to be honest i actually do get a lot of support from other accredited mm -hmm. um exercise physiologists physiotherapists etc um because i think as i said it is evidence informed it's not opinionated mm. when you go towards that opinionated that's where you're going to find a bit more conflict um it's actually just more from people who don't really understand the mm. overlying things with it you know what i mean the bigger picture and mm. they're so caught up on what another tiktok influencer told them and then they get you know sort of just taken away with that and then they become almost defensive mm, i think sure. a great example of that is like when you said something so innocent as like you like doing lateral raises or something because it helped build up your shoulder for footy so you can cop hits which yeah. is obviously essential you need to build enough muscle tissue around there like of course for rugby as well yeah. and someone just completely tore you down like what, what was that about what did they ridiculous say? yeah I, I remember like promote saying you know what one of the best things i ever did for my for footy um was was lateral raises and obviously it's a, not like a sports specific exercise mm. Um, and that was like when the hype of, you know, training like an athlete was going around. I feel like it was a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, so I just got torn to shreds. Like, that's not the right, you know, that can't be. And it's like, well, for me and my personal experience, that was like such a good result because it protected my shoulders, um, you know. And, and yeah, get, like getting torn apart on that behalf. Yeah. I probably didn't deliver the video well enough. You know, you need to explain everything. And That's a big point is the, your form of communication. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think especially with social media, you're presenting yourself to the world and it's like, the message that you do portray has to really fit it. Mm. Um, yeah, in saying that, I find that when it does come training like an athlete and training like a bodybuilder, mm. there are these major differences that I think people do get confused on a lot. Mm. Um, do you mind if I break it down yeah, a little mate, bit? We yeah, we want to hear it. Feel so same. basically the biggest difference when training like a bodybuilder is there's a few things. The main thing is you're focusing on that mind-muscle connection. So basically there's a thing called the Henneman size principle. Have you heard of it before? Never. No, used to me. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what it in indicates is that the stronger action potential that you shoot from your motor cortex, right? 
the stronger signal that you recruit and you're getting into those motor units, mm -hmm. the more size you're gonna put on. So essentially that's the main principle we're going off when we're focusing on training like a bodybuilder whose main goals are hypertrophy slash muscle building. Mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm doing a chest press. I'm isolating my pectoral muscles and what I'm focusing on is firstly, I would say about a three second concentric phase where we're really just squeezing the muscle, feeling it, flexing it. Then we go into about a three to four second eccentric phase where we're taking a very slow, causing stress, damage, and constant tension. Yeah. Mm. So that's training like a bodybuilder, where as I said, you're mostly focusing on that mind muscle connection and that eccentric phase. Moving on to an athlete, they're more task oriented with their training. I'll give you an example, jammer press. So stepping through and coming to yeah, it. Yeah. It's not necessarily isolating a muscle, but what it actually is doing is teaching him to move efficiently through mm. a plane of motion, mm. right? So it's more, I would say that's more task oriented where the other one is more my muscle connection oriented. Mm. So I'd say they are the main two differences yeah. when it does come training like a bodybuilder and training like an athlete. However, when training like an athlete, there's space for both. Mm. There's space for hypertrophy, totally there's space for that. plyometrics, you know what I mean? There's like, we also do a lot of eccentric work as well to provide nice healthy muscle bellies, mm. but yeah in a sense it's like it's not one or the other it's a blend mm -hmm. yeah for sure and and obviously you've had huge results with your athletes and oh, yeah, yeah I'd, we'd love to hear about them yeah yeah definitely so i'll give you one example a case study um his name is jake so he came and started with me last year in september mm. coming in weighing 85 kilos he did one year or he was playing soccer before and then he did one year of rugby league and got scouted for saint george mm. harrett matthews mm -hmm. um and he came in weighing 85 kilos. To this day now, I believe he weighs 98.9 kilos. <laughs> so he gained a lot of weight. We took yeah. care of his nutrition. He's training very well. He's scoring like, I would say two tries on average per game, mm. which is very exciting. Um, we have dealt with some injuries in the past as well with him. But as I said, if we just take on the right programming and looking at the long-term development of our athletes, you're going to find results like that. For sure. How, when did this stuff kind of click for you? Because I feel like it's been kind of a new thing, this training like an athlete, mm. um, you know, especially in Australia. Like I know in the AFL world, the, the uh, exercise science behind it is a little bit, you know, behind and mm. it's especially in the American world. When did it kind of come to fruition for you? So basically that was when I started MMA. Mm. So I came from a bodybuilding background actually. So I started about 50, or I was boxing initially, then went into bodybuilding at about 15 slash calisthenics. Mm -hmm and then moved into towards MMA. And doing MMA, I saw I was very strong, but just so, I just couldn't move. I was very unidimensional, mm. wasn't able to flow as much, not as mobile. Yeah. And I saw the gaps, like I had guys that were probably, I was weighing in about 90 kilos. I had guys 70 kilos putting me on my ass, mm. based on technique, based on the way their body was conditioned. That made me realize, okay, this is, you can't, just focus on hypertrophy solely mm. in order to get the results you want. There's got to be plyometrics. There's got to be mobility. There's got to be sports specific stuff. And that's where I sort of came up with this model, which essentially is a pyramid. So with this pyramid, the base mm. of it is mobility, being able to move freely in the full range of motion. On top of that is strength in the full range of motion. So basically adding the actual resistance to it. On top of that is power, mm. which is moving resistance fast and with intent. And then at the very top of that pyramid is sports, sports mm. specific. Now, what I see often is a lot of people come in, well, like younger players, they always come in and just go straight to sports, mm. often least injuries, yeah. right? Because they haven't done their groundwork. The foundation's yeah. not there. Causes a long history of, you know, constant injuries, possible surgeries, et cetera. And it can affect your mental health greatly. Mm. I get a lot of guys who are coming in depressed and, you know, I've had this one guy who came in, he was gonna get bilateral shoulder surgery and you know really really torn down from it because training was everything for him i said give me 12 weeks let me see what i can do with it mm. now he's fine yeah you know what i mean he's, he's i think he's last time we had him on he was like incline benching 42 and a half kilo dumbbells mm. very strong fella yeah so in saying that quick side note for anyone that does have shoulder injuries my best advice for it is get rotational work done yeah, yeah. Mm. That that, same with me like my <clears throat> i'm a powerlifter mm. my bench press was always my strong point i was going into nuts hoping to like bench two times body weight like 165 plus wow. bench in comp. very strong and that got cancelled and then i kind of had 
a, sh- a shoulder issue was like a almost like an impingement and that affected my bench so mm. i couldn't even bench 130 without pain and really i got a gun physio and we've, he's literally put like a new titanium rotator thing in there and especially for like powerlifters they yeah. should all be doing like before every upper session i would do like a bunch of volume like really low weight stuff but just for the wrap that rotational stuff mm. and that just helps with my shoulder health so much so like I 100% agree with what mm, you're saying on that. Yeah. Rotational stuff is so important for shoulder health. A lot of external, internal rotation is mm. fundamental because this is another thing when it comes to, I, I can imagine you guys also learnt a lot about training through social media, mm. you know, as you aged. And looking on that, I always saw shoulder exercises were only in like the sagittal yeah. plane and the coronal plane, very little transverse plane yeah. motion. So I think incorporating that into a session is fundamental. Mm. So... When it does come to our programming, we like to train in all three planes of motion, transverse, sagittal, and coronal, mm. um, because it's a 3D world. Mm. You know what I mean? As I said, when I was on the MMA, I was so used to forward and just side, and I've got these guys twisting me. I've got to have a bit more anti-rotation. Do you know what I mean? So Yeah, for sure. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, you started out with a bodybuilding like platform. Yeah, mm. That's where you started. Mm. I've heard that through so many people who are training like athletes mm. and that kind of thing. Do you think there's a place for that? 100 percent. i am actually very grateful that i did that and even when i was training like a bodybuilder um during that time i knew it was for a purpose because i knew Mm. when i am ready for i didn't really ever have a chosen sport you know i dived into rugby league i dived a bit into boxing but nothing really clicked like Mm. me considering like mma Mm. so you know once i started getting that i realized okay i had that foundational strength I did lack in the mobility. Um, So my advice is if you are starting in the bodybuilding scene and wanting to move into that athletic scene, start with your mobility and your strength and then the power will come. So is mobility, is that just like flexibility or is it, what is it? So mobility refers to the ability to move in the, move freely in the full range of motion, Okay. right? So what I usually structure a workout is I'll always start with obviously after your like light cardio just to get your core temperature up a bit and get some blood into it I would go into a mobility like a whole body mobility routine which is essentially movement mm. it's not static stretching it's dynamic yeah right actual movement of the joints just opening up loosening up then we'll go through like a training session which is usually starts with some plyometric work stuff that's going to be a bit more demanding on the nervous system Mm -hmm. and then moves into the hypertrophy work before finishing off with some static stretching yeah i swear like going back to that mobility one my dad like raised me um i'd go to like kung fu every saturday and they'd always make you stretch like obviously dynamically at the start statically at the end yeah and that has stuck with me for life like i was doing that since i was six years old and to this day i'll be like more flexible than every single guy apart from like if they're a gym do you split yet uh like i'd be able to work up like it wouldn't yeah, take me too long really um but just like in because most blokes are so stiff and can't even touch their toes me. but yeah but like i swear doing that from a young age i've done no maintenance from that but it's, mm. it's almost stuck with me it's so strange mm. so like being able to get like ass to grass in a squat mm. or just anything like that like a good arch and a bench press it's helped me quite a bit so yeah. i like i don't know like where you even start with the mobility if you didn't do that from a young age? I think, you know, there's never a right time to start. Mm. Mm. Just start whenever you're ready. Um, I would say with mobility, frequency is important. Yeah, It's vital. I get them doing mobility every single day, right? So it's like, because you're not doing resistance training, you don't have to wait for your body to recover in order to Mm. do it again. You can do it every single day and actually promotes the recovery phase. So let's say I've got a game on Saturday. I'll have a Sunday session. We'll program in a mobility session. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Just to help with that recovery, get the joints loosened up a little bit. Um, I often see, especially with rugby union, rugby league, hips yeah, very, oh. very tight, especially with rugby union getting into that scrumming position. Yeah. You know what I mean? That is just such a... It's a little key that not a lot of people, you know, have. And if you do have that mobility, the power just comes greatly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it frees it up so much. It frees your whole body up, doesn't it? Exactly. Well, it's like, am I going to punch from here? If I only have this range of motion, mm-hmm. I'm not going to get as much power as if I punch from here with the full range of motion. Yeah, yeah. You lost the whole muscle. Um, did, uh, I found with uh, with social media and, and you know it's it's a little bit toxic sometimes in terms of um, like you can't train like athletes stop training like a bodybuilder like you, yeah. you're not allowed to do that's not necessarily what people are saying is it that what that's not what the science says that's it, there is a place for it 
There is a place for it. So as I mentioned before, there is a place for hypertrophy training. Mm. It's just your program shouldn't solely based be around it. I would say, as I said, I would have probably about per session, about four exercises, two supersets that are dedicated to hypertrophy, mm. right? Then we start, like we usually will start off with the plyometric slash um, just explosiveness work that gets the nervous system set up. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we're doing a push day. Before that push day, obviously we're all warmed up in that. I'll get them doing nice aggressive med ball slams, mm. activating the central nervous system, pretty much improving the way that your mind is sending the signal to that part of your body. Therefore, you're gonna have a stronger bench, mm. right? Because that sort of highway is already lit up. I'll give you a good analogy of what I'm saying here. Basically, imagine you're at the top of a mountain, right? And it's a snowy mountain. And you go down a certain route, like you're skiing, you go down a certain yep. route. The more you go down that route, the deeper that goes, the indent in the snow. Yeah. That's kind of similar to your body. So meaning the more I send that signal, the more often I keep sending it, it's going to be a stronger signal. It's going to be a better road to go down. Mm. So it's like rep repetition, yeah. you know what I mean? It's the power of everything. Mm. Yeah, mate, that's so interesting. So we got mobility in the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Next one is... Strength in the full range of motion. Strength, full range of motion. Yeah. So what, what's that? Can you break that down a little? Uh, essentially, it's... Let's say I'm doing a bicep curl. Mm. It's going through the full range of motion with resistance and having no gaps in your in your strength. Mm. So for example, let's say I'm doing an external shoulder rotation. Mm. My mobility lets me go all the way back. However, if I add some weight, I can only go here. Yeah. That tells me the range of motion from here to here mm. is weak. Weak. And if you go into power and sports with that weakness there, and someone puts you in a position, let's say an armbar or a oh. kimura or something, Shit. Yeah. you don't have the strength in order to resist it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So that's where when people are skipping steps, especially in the strength, you got injuries lined up for you. Yep. And then ne next one on the pyramid, power. 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 Break it down for us. Moving resistance fast and with intent, right? You're not going too heavy, anywhere between about 30 to, f you can go up to 60% one RM. Um, so kind of keeping it low, and it's just not too many reps, not too many sets. I would say, ideally, you're looking at something like four sets of six reps, mm. right? And you can do some, you can even move into stuff called French contrast method. Have you heard of that before? No, it rings a bell. Yeah. I, I couldn't break it down to you. This is one of my main methods of training, especially when it comes to rugby league, rugby union, MMA, et cetera, all athletes, essentially. So what you're starting off with is a heavy set. Let's do the lower body, for example. So your first exercise is gonna be a heavy squat, right? A nice heavy compound lift. Moving forward, you're gonna superset that with a body weight jump, then moving into a weighted jump, mm. and then finalizing with an assisted jump. Mm. I've got them all over my TikTok, I do a lot of that. Um, so if you ever wanna check it out, just have a look on that. Um, but essentially that is, I would say, the pinnacle of power training, mm. where it's like you just, you, and it's got that hypertrophy style with it, but it's just, Give it a go and you'll see what I mean with it. Can you give us an example of like an exercise? Yeah, for, oh, for those, yeah, well, that's essentially it. It's yeah. basically like the squat yeah. is the first set. So that's 1A. Yeah. Yeah. 1B is CMJ jumps, counter movement jumps, which yeah. is essentially triple extension, which is like yeah. providing that power from the lower body, extending at the hips, knees, and ankles. Then moving into a light weighted jump, right? And then finishing, so that's just holding dumbbells by your side and then finishing with an assisted jump. For example, having a resistance band here mm. and providing that assistance yeah. with you. So you're gonna get a little bit more hops in a sense. Oh, that sounds full on. With, and I know that power stuff even obviously relates to power lifting. Mm. Um, oh yeah, you find a lot of benefits But that. like uh, just keeping that velocity nice and high and mm. just intent, like when you're moving that weight, like move it, like get That's it the main thing is intent. Yeah. So like for example, with a gem press, my main cue is just move that weight aggressively, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Have intent behind it because that goes back to sending that signal. Mm. The stronger signal you send, that's what it's gonna happen. So for example, if I'm tackling someone, if my signal's stronger than theirs, they're gonna be on the ground rather than me. Mm. Otherwise, vice versa, if my signal's not strong enough and I can't plant correctly and I can't, you know, provide the force needed to put this guy on the ground, then he's going to put me on the ground. Yeah. And keeping that velocity high is like a way to progressively overload because if you can, for example, I'll have days where I bench, squat and deadlift light. Mm. So not with a big load, but if you can move that weight quicker than you did last week, then mm. you're improving a lot. And that's one of the best ways you can actually progressively overload. I like that a lot because... 
commonly what I'm seeing, the main form of progressive overload, putting on more weights. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's not necessary. And I'm finding that's what's causing a lot of injuries as well, is there's so many ways of progressively overloading in a sense where you can utilize time on the tension you can mm. utilize yeah as i said the heavier weight the velocity yep. you got to get creative with it yeah it doesn't have to be one dimensional no it doesn't exactly so and it's like there's going to be a point where you sort of plateau on the weights and it's like all right how else am i going to challenge this all right so last on the pyramid we've got sports correct break it down for us brother okay I'm going to give you an example. That's probably the easiest way of saying it. Um, so let's say we're working in towards an MMA athlete. So moving into a sports-specific exercise is something like doing wrestling shoots mm. with a resistance band around your hips. So you can see how we're taking a movement that you're going to see in that sport and pretty much drilling it into the session, mm. right? So if, I'll give you another example. Let's say a rugby a tight head prop. I get them doing a scrum hold position, like an isometric hold. As you can see, it's getting them in a position where they're gonna see that on field. Mm. You get what I mean? So a lot of the time when it comes to strength and conditioning, people get this mixed up idea. When we say sports specific, they think that's the whole program. It has to be sports specific. Mm. If it's like, for example, a bench press, if you don't see that in the sport, then don't do it. Yeah. It's not like that. It's a mm. very tiny little part and you're gonna do it towards the end of this program. So let's say it's an eight, let's take my MMA fighter that I've got fighting in five weeks. The initial four weeks, we're addressing the strength, the mobility, yes, the plyometrics, and a bit of sports specific. As we taper into his fights, uh, into the fight, sorry, we're gonna limit the eccentric because we don't want him having doms, we don't want him, you know what I mean? What we're trying to focus on is the power and the sports specific as yeah. we taper off. So mostly the concentric phase and things he's gonna see in the ring. That's yeah. That's actually so crazy how similar that is to my overall power lifting mm. program. Like when I'm leading up into a comp, it gets so specific. So you're testing maxes, like mm. really reducing all of that volume. But that's when you go into singles training and doubles, and the equipment gets very specific. So it's really amazing to see the same ideologies mm. between you and our coach Josh. So yeah, for sure. You both had the same coach, yeah, Josh. Uh, yeah, he handles my powerlifting stuff, and he handles your kind of more footy and longevity. Yeah. he's a personal trainer. He's a sports Ex exercise science. Nice, exercise nice. Scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, nice. What uni did he go to? Oh, I think Monash, Deakin, or something like that. I don't that. know. Yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. nice. That's good. Hey. Yeah, it's crazy. You guys are on the exact same way. Well, as I said, it's evidence based. You know what I mean? He probably learned the same thing I learned, and it's about sort of. I like to say evidence-informed practice instead of evidence-based practice. And the difference between that is evidence-based is taking on that evidence and just, okay, this is the way we're gonna work. Whereas evidence-informed is rather getting your bank of knowledge based off evidence and making your own decision on that and saying, what's the best practice I can do for this athlete? Yeah. So I think that's very important where you can have that sort of you sort of make your own decisions in what's the most efficient way. Because mm. I assume you get these coaches that haven't actually spent any time in the weights room themselves and they're literally just a textbook teacher and they're like, here's a slideshow, this is what we're gonna give the athlete, but they don't have any of that experience themselves, which is why it's really good. Like Josh, he was our, our coach, he was like a national level powerlifter, like really, really good. You've obviously got your own yeah. um, background in sports and do you have a comment to make on that at all? Practice what you preach. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? So I'll give you an example. As I did my final years in uni, you do a thousand hours of placement, clinical placement. And I wasn't the best in the books. Mm. You know what I mean? I was getting average marks, nothing crazy. But where I really did excel was building relations, was you know being able to talk to people, developing that rapport, but then also structuring a program correctly based on my experience with the gym as well. So I think, you know, anyone who is along the lines of being a personal trainer, an exercise physiologist, physiotherapist, whatever it is, your best te the best classroom is gonna be the gym. Yeah. Do the, you know what I mean? The, every, you know, people in your in, in your world, sports and exercise science, I, every single one has the same personality trait of like super fucking passionate. Oh, you like have just to be. You, you have to be. Yeah. Right? I work seven days a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I wasn't passionate, I wouldn't be doing that. So I think, um, yeah, it's more than work. What it is to me, it's more like a mission seeing where can we take the human body? Mm. What are the capabilities? What are the limitations? <clears throat> what are we able to achieve if we get all the variables correct? And when I say variables, I'm referring to, yes, the training, also the nutrition, also the sleep. 
Yeah. Mm. Right. So I think they're my big three is taking care of those as well as going in towards the mental side of things and as well as the mental training. I think that's yeah. very important. But if we can control all those variables, then you've got a very dangerous athlete on your hands. Yeah. Mm. And the last thing I wanted to touch on on the tip of that pyramid there for sports specific. So you said the one of the biggest mistakes is when an athlete just concentrates only yeah. on the sport specific and it leads to injury. And like, what does, is that some sort of athlete that's had their head in TikTok the whole time and they're like, I can only do sports specific movements. I can't do anything else. And is that just a recipe for disaster? 100%, 100%. That goes against so many principles in strength and conditioning, in that strength and conditioning world. Um, you know, sports specific, as I said, it has its place. Hypertrophy has its place. Power training has its place. It's about balancing it and finding when is the right time to do this? Yeah. When is the right time to do that? So as I said before, with sports specific, Leave it towards the tapering. You know what I mean? Before a, before a big game, like the day before a big game, if you want to get a session in, you're not going to be doing a one rep, one rep max squat. You know what yeah. I mean? You, you're going <laughs> yeah. to... Honestly, you're going to go, you know, more towards the... Um, testing in the morning. Yeah. The day. <laughs> I, I really... Stay away from that. pre warning. Um, yeah, basically, you're going to limit those eccentric phases basic because that's going to lead to those doms and you don't want to be playing when you're sore you mm. know what i mean a day before a session i'd recommend get more your plyometric work in mm. um stuff that's not going to be too demanding on the nervous system and just keep it light and fun is that like the dexterity type of stuff is that what it's called where you're like throwing balls getting your and doing eyes and that and depends on the sport is yeah. that is that called dexterity though is that, that the right oh, term or is it something else ask. Oh, I don't think so. I don't wrong. think so. I'm not 100%. Don't quote me. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I might not be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Nah, maybe. I reckon he's right. I leave it. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll see. Yeah. We'll we'll see. For, yeah. For, for everyone at home listening, we're going to. Uh, this is a lot of information. Like, yeah. for, for someone, you know, like it's a lot of information to take in. We're going to break this down and tell you what you can do at home to, to start improving yourself in a second. Gab, first, let's kind of keep a roof over our oh, head. Yeah. As usual, mate, you know, it's this podcast equipment isn't cheap. We're chatting before. What do you reckon? 11 grand for all the podcasts? I think we're about 11 grand in deep yeah, into so, the podcast gear. Um, thanks for the uh, loan from the NAD bank or whatever's <laughs> going on. No, Nimble. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 30% interest per day. <laughs> anyway, we do have to keep this roof over our head. You know, Louis and I are living by ourselves. Heaters haven't been on all winter. We're wearing the 9 5 <laughs> jumpers. Soup all day. Um, we have our own product. So I have my power building program, which is the way I like to train, which incorporates powerlifting style with bodybuilding. So it is not training like an athlete. It is training to, to <laughs> absolutely cute. have the fattest squat bench deadlift you possibly can whilst having an aesthetic physique. So it goes against all the kind of principles for coordinated sports in this <laughs> podcast here but it is also the best program for that everyone's on it it's got all these reviews you're all loving it it's 11 weeks got a testing phase at the end uh if you're just making up your workouts in the gym then invest in yourself it's only 50 bucks and you'll get so much out of it if you actually follow it closely and that is completely different to how Louis Boy over here trains is, the footy beast. It is different. Um, however, I'm promoting something different today. The running program, mate, oh, yeah. we haven't talked about it in ages. Now, it's 10 bucks. It's got three different running programs in it. It's it's ridiculous. Like, it's a ridiculous deal. We make, we make nothing on it, but we need more people to use it. Yeah. So um, check out the running program. It'll make you fit. It'll make you fit in the quickest time possible. It's disgusting, isn't it? Like, yeah, it we sucks. refuse to do it just because it's month-worthy kind of yeah, runs. Yeah, I've, I've done each of them once, and maybe I'll do it <laughs> yeah. pre-season. All yours now. Yeah. Practice yeah. what you preach, eh? So if you want a bit <laughs> of structure to your running and you're not just you know you, you got comments being like bro you don't need a just run. program to run just all right then bloody kachobi or whatever. <laughs> it's like just relax this is for people that like need a bit of guidance it's like exactly. 10 bucks bro yeah exactly. it's, it's not it's not much and if you use the code podcast it'll be nine bucks so yeah. even cheaper it's 10 percent off Back. last thing we want to plug is just down merch it is it's pretty frosty i don't know how you're wearing a t-shirt mate yeah, honestly i got a rep yeah, that's yeah. it <laughs> i got a rep i've got a rep yeah. Yeah. mike dyson's in there exactly yeah. so so we've got these jumpers here um, and the, the tracksuit pants as well, along with a whole other merch line. Um, we're doing a, a cool photo shoot for this stuff soon. We're, we're running out of the tracksuits fast, so um, buy them if you want them. Absolutely load up. We love seeing you guys purchases. Louis actually sends them out um, himself. Mm. I don't with do a kiss. thing. Yeah, he, he, with a kiss, with a spray of aftershave. Oh, should um, do that. Just a bit of love in there. We will also be sending out these little um, gel moisturizer. Yeah, little sachets. Little, little samples in there just because we thought it would be a nice touch. So any orders from now on, we'll get that. And uh, 
Load up on the orders, guys. Keep that roof over our head uh, and you can use code PODCAST to get 10% off. We absolutely love you. And back to the regularly scheduled program. Great work, mate. You're getting better at that every <laughs> single week. <laughs> now, they've heard all this information. Um, it's a lot to digest. Mm. I've put down here like a big buzzword at the moment is plyometrics, mm. especially on social media. It's like plyometrics, if you do it, it's steroids for athletes, which yes. I love. I love that yes. quote. It's, that's unreal. I'm doing plyometrics and I'm really enjoying it. Mm. Um, and, and I love it. Now... It's, it's difficult to explain to people how to get started. You know, like I'm very lucky I can afford a coach and mm. he, he programs it for me and I go and do it. And it's very specific to me. Mm. But then I get questions on TikToks. What should I be doing? Like mm. I'm 16, you know, I go to the gym, but I want to start training more like an athlete. I'm mm. getting told to all the time. How should they do that? How can they put this into effect? What should they start with? Okay, that's a really good question. I would say starting with plyometrics, you don't want to jump into the deep end, mm. right? Definitely. So what I would say is work towards your light plyometric work. Working even skipping is mm. enough, you know what I mean? Just building up that elastic property with the muscles, with the fascia. Yeah. Um, also, I would say movements like ice skaters are fantastic. They're more the lateral plyometrics. I would say when doing plyometrics, focus on the lateral as well as the sagittal, meaning the sideways and the forward and back. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say essentially you want to start light, keep the rep range of about four, four sets of six reps. Um, and then as you're progressing through it, make them a little bit more complicated. I'll give you an example. So let's say a basic level one plyometric exercise is a broad jump right that's nice and simple you'll do something like four continual reps and then have about a minute and a half off and then do another four three sets what, what is a broad jump can you just illustrate? a broad jump is basically you starting in a baseline and then you're just using everything you've got yep. to project yourself forward okay right yep. so it's a movement called triple extension mm -hmm. right we might put a video up if we can and yep, just show sure. an example of that now the way i like to go up to level two is right after that broad jump so i've just jumped and i've landed i'll add in a high knee jump mm -hmm. so a high knee tuck so you can see how it's starting to get a little bit more layered then if i want to go to level three what i'll do is like a hip extension to a broad to a high knee tuck yeah so you can see how it's becoming a bit more layered right and then i'll give you a lateral version of that so you'll start off with like ice skaters and then on the last rep if you want to go into like more advanced you'll do like a rotational jump landing into a broad jump. So I think if we can get some video examples of these, that would yeah, be great yeah, to really that, yeah. explain that. Um, but yeah, I would say start simple and just start adding pieces to it. Mm -hmm. Figuring out, okay, these are really good ones. Um, and I just want to start making it a bit more layered with the plyometric work. If you on the opposite end of the spectrum towards the end bit, it goes towards that French contrast method that I mentioned earlier, which is mm. sort of just, you know, incorporating weights into the plyometrics. Mm. Like I would ad advise anyone beginning with plyometrics, don't start with any mm. weights or resistance, just work on your body weight, mastering that mm. and overload in towards adding resistance to your plyometrics. You can use like a uh, weight vest, you can hold dumbbells by your side, etc. Mm. But I would say, yeah, if you definitely do start, if you are looking to get in towards that athletic routine, um, but just do it appropriate. Progressive mm. overload is the basis of everything. Don't skip steps because that often leads to injuries, shin splints, etc. To get even more specific, mm. let's say, I mean, so when I first started with plyo, I started with um, bounds, mm. single leg bounds, mm. then box jumps. Mm. Um, I'm doing like a broad, I uh, started with broad jumps, now I'm doing a banded broad jump. Mm. Should they, and then I was also doing like um, sprint mechanic stuff. So the A marches on the wall, that yeah. helped me hugely, especially with my osteitis pubis in my groin. Yes, um, I saw. So, like where where should these sh should they start with bounds like j it, 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 is is that where they start you know bounds are great i would say start with body weight as i said yep. and then you see how you mentioned you started with broad and then went into broad with the resistance band yep adding the resistance mm -hmm. element to mm -hmm. it so that's a way of progressing your plyometrics i would say um reactivity is another big one so for example how fast you can generate that force so let's say you did that broad jump to high knee tuck as soon as you've learned that broad jump go straight into the high knee tuck so in the initial when you start it you'll notice there's a bit of a delay as you become more elastic as you become a bit more efficient at being forced developing that force generation you're going to see that okay i've over i've progressed in that plyometric phase mm. you know what i mean yeah yeah no that's that's and how long would you say you've been doing the plyo stuff for louis um probably six months to a year oh probably a, a, about a year yeah and year it's and just and a half. like night and day the difference you feel yeah it, it's like in your body. I don't know. It's obviously, it's kind of hard to explain what I've felt with it, but mm. 
I feel so much more free through my body. I feel mm. so much more confident when I play footy. Mm. Now, if I get the ball, I'm always going to try and take it on because like, I just have confidence in my body. Yep. Whereas before, I was having so many groin issues. I was a little bit slower. Like yeah. I just wasn't as, as almost twitchy. Yeah. Um, so, so that kind of stuff. But the huge thing for me was the, the lack of injuries and, and being yeah, able to wow. navigate through injuries. Um, and, and I'm seeing that. So I, I play like, like local level footy, mm. um, but it's still a senior level. And like the hits in local level footy are just as big as they are in the AFL. Like it's yeah. not, no, I'm not saying it's any quicker, like it's not as good as the AFL, but like the hits still hurt. Mm. And when you have people like an 18 year old who rock, rocks up to play their first senior game mm. and they get crunched, mate, we, you know, we have four injuries, four just like preventable injuries this year. Mm. It's like, so that kind of stuff is why you need to do it. Like you're literally looking after your body. Yeah, definitely. And as as you said, where I think it comes towards the confidence is coming from force generation. Mm. Being like, look, my body is capable of providing more force than this opposing player. Mm. And if you can keep developing that, then your confidence is going to skyrocket. Mm. And I found the similar gains when I started going into MMA. The more I started doing plyometrics and becoming explosive, I was just, I was one of the best when it came to like getting low and just shooting in and mm. pretty much take doing my takedowns. Yeah. Before, just very slow, sluggish, and that's just because I was focusing purely on hypertrophy. Mm. There was no, there was no intent behind the movement. Mm. You know what I mean? It was more the time on the tension, muscle connection. So it's like now it's more about how fast can your motor cortex shoot the action potential going down the nervous system to generate a force or mm. a task, mm. essentially. So it's like as I went back to that tackling example, it's like how can I produce enough force to overcome this opponent? Mm, mate, it's fantastic. Mm. What about sprint mechanics? Like oh, I love sprint mechanics. Love, love, I love sprint mechanics. I've, I've gotten a lot out of sprint mechanics. Yeah, like, what are I you doing at the moment? I used to run oh, like A marches yeah. or just, I think, very basic stuff. Yeah. The wall, wall ones. Wall switches, yeah. 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 I'm trying to think of other stuff. I've de I'm definitely doing other One, stuff. One, two, three holds. They're good ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Oh, I'm doing... Um, Oh, it might be a plyometric exercise. The uh, uh, lunge deceleration. Very good. Love very that. Good. It's fantastic. A Three note part. on that mm. is I think deceleration is a fundamental aspect people aren't doing enough. Mm. You know what I mean? So acceleration, it refers to that plyometric explosiveness, but it's only as good as you can control. Mm. You don't want to overshoot. So a really good analogy that one of my coaches gave me is power is like a key, right? You don't put a key in and overturn it and break the key. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Open. Everyone's getting drunk. Oh, fuck. Kicks the door down. Yeah, anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You want Classic. it just as much as you need. Yeah. Don't overshoot. And when that comes to decelerating. You know yeah. what I mean? So I think there's a space for acceleration and deceleration work. Make sure they're even. Make sure they're in proportion because you don't want to be too strong in one or the other. Mm. So yeah, yeah. So so sprint mechanics. Are you? How should people train it? Like, what what, what are we starting with? Okay, this is how I go about it. Yeah. Let's say we're doing a leg day, mm. right? An athletic leg day. Firstly, we'll start off obviously with the cardio, go into the warm up of the mobility, and then we'll work into our sprint mechanics. I'll give you guys a really really great example for your beginners in um, sprint mechanics mm. to give this a go. Start off with 20 meters of A skips, mm. building up the form. So that's a hop switch. Yep. Then on the way back, do one, two, three holds with your arms up high. Then finish off with triple wall switches. Mm. I think if you do three sets of that, do that for about four weeks, every leg session you do, you're going to find tremendous gains in your sprints. I love you know that. I mean? That's so, a TikTok right there, man. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. We we'll even do the video example. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I think if you've got those three, a great circuit to start off with. Level two version of that would be something like double A skips, B skips, mm. um, one, two, three holds with a weight on your back instead, um, and then triple wall switches with a resistance band around your hips. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you can see how it's just like building up on it. Yeah. It's brick by brick. We're just yep. adding a little bit more elements something to stress the body where it goes okay we need to adapt mm. we need to change because we're not strong enough for this movement but i i, I had issues uh, had issues with my groin i've had them for, mm, for ages yeah, they're, I I, they're, they're getting a lot better now yeah. but my physio asked me to send a video of me running back you know three three years ago and he's a he's a sprinter mm. he's a jet and he 
looked at my running style, broke it down for me, like screenshot it. And my running form, like I was just all crumpled up. And he's like that internal rotation. Like yeah. that's exactly where you're ruining your groin. Like that, that's what it is, mate. And you do that every time you sprint. It's like, oh, well, we need to change that. But how do you, you know, change sprinting? Do you see how, firstly on that, do you see how it came back to the internal rotation? Yeah. It's a lot like the shoulder and the hip are the same joint. It's a ball and socket joint, Yeah, right? So it's like getting that rotational work is fundamental when it comes to these two joints. Mm. So I'll just really suggest on that on the side note. Now back to your question on um, with the sprint mechanics, mm. like building up, changing your sprint form, it's essentially it's repetition is the master of all skills, mm. right? You've learned to run this certain way your whole life. You've got to now unlearn that and yeah. reprogram yeah, wow. subconsciously how to move like this. Mm. So if I gave you a video of like one of my clients doing their first time doing a skips to eight weeks after, mm. you couldn't recognize it. Yeah. And that's just the power of repetition. You know mm. what I mean? Back to that ski analogy, it's that you've sent that signal so many times to do the a skips in this certain way or sprint this certain way. Mm. Now that route is the one you're going to go down, not the fresh route. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it takes a lot of conscious effort to create new routes. Mm. You know what I mean? So I think um, moving on to that as well, being conscious, being present when you're training is fundamental. Yeah. It's mm. fun. Like, don't don't worry too much about the music. Don't worry too much about those external stimulus. Mm. You want to be present. You want to be focusing on the movement you're doing, whether you're training like an athlete or a bodybuilder, because the athlete needs the intent. And the bodybuilder needs a mind muscle connection. Mm. So B, that's my piece of advice. Try, like I personally don't train with any music. I just like to be present. Psycho. Yeah, I, I, I'm insane. <laughs> I'm on a mission. Who hurt you, I'm bro? on a, Yeah, honestly, honestly. <laughs> the villain arc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly. Um, breakups. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? Oh, don't get us started, oh, mate. Oh no. We'll be in tears. No, no, I'm, I'm on a. Yeah, I had a recent one actually. Oh, yeah. oh, two oh, weeks ago. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, shit. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> But yeah, essentially that's, you know what I mean? That's where yeah. I would say is being conscious is very important to being a good athlete slash bodybuilder. You, you must see like a lot of local level, le local level athletes and even, you know, professional athletes and just think, fuck, I could change your world. I could rock your world. Because if they're not training like this, I mean, they're missing out on so much. I feel like there's so much like unlocked potential out there. 100%. And it's, it's a whole new space. Like yeah. you're capitalizing on it in such a great way, I reckon. Mm, thank you. Um, but yeah, do, do you see that a lot? Like athletes and, and what about like your personal athletes that yeah. you, you know, before befores and after? Talk us through that. Yeah, 100%. So when it comes to like the before and after, as I mentioned that case study of Jake, you know, him being able to put in about 15 kilos of muscle in, I think it's in a span of about seven months mm. something like that is crazy then again he is a young man who you know his body's obviously in that state of growing he's going through puberty that sort of thing so i would say when you start impl like implementing the strength and conditioning protocols as well as the sleep as well as the nutrition it's just a formula for success mm. yeah do you know what i mean let it's this is my favorite quote humans lie numbers don't lie Mm. you know what i mean so like if the numbers are correct and the evidence has supported this method of training and this method of uh recovery there's nothing left to do but execute mm. you know what i mean you're not thinking is this the right thing is this the right thing you've got the blueprint it's correct just execute now put your effort on execution mm. that's, that's so similar to like the journey i experienced that yeah i know it's it's a broken record by mm. now but everyone thought i like ran gear or something on it like 68 kilos at the start of the year nine mm. months later i was 85 without gaining like barely any fat yeah literally just eating 3200 calories a day with 200 grams of protein on a proper program and i started sleeping properly and um, all your variables were covered exactly Do you know what i mean yeah. and i can see you're a very methodical person you're very analytical with it and it's like i know you did a little bit of fine tuning where yeah. it's like all right this wasn't the best for my sleep maybe i need to cut the caffeine back you yeah, know what yeah, i mean exactly that's what it's about it's about letting the data like even with business you let data run your business you let data run your body you know what i mean so that's where yeah if you have the fortune the luxury of having an apple watch tracking it or a garment tracking your sleep yeah. is important getting the numbers on those tracking your calories how much are you consuming per day how much are you burning per day 
it's all fundamental to being a great being a professional athlete in a sense so part two of keeping a roof over our head there's no leaks in the roof it, it's a cold winter the heaters are on uh, we have manscaped and we also have tomorrow skincare who should we start with this time louis mm, tomorrow skincare tomorrow skincare ah uh, yes well they have some very good products we um we like them they keep our skin very clear it, it, it's just the quality of the products that like astounds me every time you know like I, I i just froth them so much like even this moisturizer bottle mate i don't know if you realize but every time you pump it there's like a thing in the bottom there that goes up so that it never what so 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 the cream doesn't just sit at the bottom like the attention to detail is just like so out of this world mate. and it's so much better than anything mm. you've seen <laughs> That's actually crazy. How good is that? I know, I just realized. Because I, I thought I had it tipped upside down in my bag and I was like trying to shake it to get it to the bottom <laughs> so I could use And I realized. Anyway. That's crazy. But yeah, high quality stuff. Have you ever used Tomorrow Skincare? I haven't, Not but um, I'm actually very excited to use it. I actually met the owners yesterday oh, and fantastic. they were going over you know, pretty much what goes into their products and the depth of detail these guys have went into. Mm. I'm just really excited to be able to start yeah. using these products, especially with, um, I believe it was... <coughs> Yeah, this one, the, the liquid toner. Yeah. Um, with them, one of them had the amino acids, which I was very oh, excited. Oh, this one. No, no, that's so the, it's the serum? gel moisturizer oh, has gel. amino acids and peptides in it. It makes it sound like trend for your skin. <laughs> Except trend is bad for your skin, but like, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. It, it basically, it's steroids for your skin. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I'm really excited to be able to use that. And with vitamin E as well, which is, yeah. you know, yeah. being shown to be very beneficial for your skin and, health. And, and it's cool because it's like, I feel like we've got this community of, you know, fitness influence is kind of a cringe word but you know of people creators right and we're all on the same sponsors and it's just cool because there's like continuity there it's consistent mm. um none of us will ever succumb to marketing bullshit products mm. right and mm. we want this high quality like it, it was even good to see like prime post about it the other mm. day because we've all had our struggles with acne and whatnot and it's yeah. just good we want to put you guys onto the good quality products so if you do want to buy anything from tomorrow skincare the link is in our bio um, you can use code NTF and you'll get 20% off and purchase whatever products you want. We love you. Thank you. Next up, we got Manscaped. They've been around with us for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, they've been good to us, the boys at Manscaped. Um, they have the new lawnmower 4.0 out. Yep. Keep your nuts safe. Yep. Don't slice anything up. Yeah, I was uh, given the... Uh I don't have much upper body hair, but my nipples tend to get really hairy for yeah, some reason. Wolverine. So just, yeah, it's weird, bro. It's like nothing anywhere else, just my nipples. So I just ran the nipples over it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I will shave the legs the other day, mate. They're looking sharp. When I eh? shave my legs, mate, the quads are just... 50% bigger. How long does that take you? Two hours, eh? Yeah. Oh, get around the whole thing. Yeah, no, get around bro, the whole So quick. I reckon eight really, minutes. Eight minutes. Really? Wow. I don't do the best job on the back it's of the It's a good mower, eh? <laughs> I just do the quads. Yeah, Lou to do it, eh? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the glutes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I need a girlfriend. Glutes <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, stop. Uh, get the gooch. Oh, no. <laughs> just, just, just cough, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I know you guys are mates, but damn. Yeah. It's taking it the next level. Yeah. Anyway, so you can use code uh, NTF, get 20% off and free shipping. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, get uh, hairless, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Um, now, Gav, you put up a story earlier this afternoon saying, we got a mailbag. We got like a really cool sports exercise scientist coming in and we're so excited. Um, normally, when we do mailbag, uh, things the questions are dog shit. They're like, oh, Brock, is this good? Yeah, is, like, is this good poo poo wee wee? Yeah, like <laughs> fucking yeah. Who, when did you have sex? Anyway, <laughs> somehow people just like racked their brains on this weird Sunday arvo and asked some genuine belter questions. Oh, like, it, like it's so exciting. So anyway, <laughs> we're starting off with underscore Owen Rice. He says key personality traits of the top athletes um, you've worked with. Okay, great question. Firstly. Mm -hmm. What comes to my mind, I'm just going to throw a bunch of words out there and then elaborate a bit more. Mm. Tenacity, uh, consistency, analytical, methodical, um, passionate, driven. So I would say essentially it's someone who has the foresight of where they want to be and nothing's going to stop them to get there. Mm. You know what I mean? They are willing to sacrifice mm. a lot. I would say sacrificing is probably the f number one trait, the ability to be disciplined where you go, okay, you know what? I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm going to get a good night's yeah. rest because I want to be able to perform tomorrow. Mm. You know what I mean? As simple as that, as simple as choosing the chicken, rice and broccoli over the Big Mac. Mm. You know what I mean? I would say they, these are key traits where they seem simple, but when it comes down to it, when your body's craving it yeah. and yeah. being able to be like, nah, this is more important, making this decision. 
I think that's a key trait when it comes to training athlete or to athletes being the best. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. Great. No great. Stone unturned type setup. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Great answer. All right. We got underscore Isaac underscore Barnes. Does headgear do anything? Great question. So. When it comes to, I'm assuming he's asking about concussions, mm. right? Headgear, does it help with the concussions? My number one tip when it comes to preventing the impact of concussions is neck strengthening. Mm. So I would say invest in your neck strengthening exercises. Things as simple as chin tucks, adding a resistance band on, um, even like the side flexion, getting neck mobility. I'll throw in a few exercise examples that we can go over and we can have a look at those. Um, But essentially, if you have a strong neck, like I do that with all my boxers, all the MMA athletes, even the rugby boys, because what's happening is, let's take boxing for example. If you get hit in the head, it's not essentially the punch that's causing the concussion. It's the whiplash. Yeah. It's the skull mm-hmm. smacking on the base. Uh, sorry, the brain smacking on the yeah. base of the skull. So essentially, if you are looking to prevent concussions and the impact of that, I would really, really um, convince you to go towards the neck strengthening exercises and stuff like preventative um, stuff where it's like you're adding in external forces. For example, we get like a resistance band around our MMA athletes yeah. and I'll be on the yeah. side and I'll be like yanking it and they have to flex the side of their neck to resist that yeah. because it's preventing that whiplash effect. This is a topic I'm really fascinated by. Mm. I remember as a kid, I kept breaking my arms playing soccer and my dad was really big into martial arts, particularly judo. So he taught me how to break fall. And so that does obviously two things, protects your head and like my limbs from just like, I used to just fall like a, a plank and I broke my arm <laughs> like three over. times, literally. <laughs> and so he taught me like when you fall, you fall like that, break it with your kind of hand and decelerate. Neck. Yeah, like that. Yeah. And I can just imagine like I would do that because in soccer tackles and everything like yeah. that, that would save my head so much. Mm. And then I also got into a bit of neck training as well, just through like bodybuilding what stuff. What did you get into? The main one I was doing was wearing a beanie and doing like plate loaded neck curls. Yes, so going yes. off the back of a bench like that. Neck I'm not extensive. sure how functional that is, but my neck like kind of has a six pack on it now. <laughs> from it, so. Especially with the deadlifts as yeah, well, exactly. getting it up. Because when you have a thick neck, it just looks like you can lift a lot of weight as well as you can lift, with a lot yeah. of sleep apnea. <laughs> it's all the way. Yeah, yeah no, nah, fantastic. So, so do you reckon just quickly like a helmet does anything? I think... It has its benefits. You know, if I was playing rugby union, I'd be probably wearing one as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but I would say go towards the neck strengthening. If you are, if he's referring to concussions, I'd say that's your number one line mm-hmm. of defense. Um, and the rest is sort of supplementary. Love that. Never hear about that in footy. People need to be doing more neck strengthening oh, stuff. Oh, definitely, definitely fundamental. Next question, Jack Scott underscore underscore. Great question again. He says, is there a common thing people do for performance that is actually negative? I'm thinking... I'm just thinking about footy training the other night. We did warm up and then straight into static stretching. There you go. There you <laughs> Who go. Who the fuck's right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That guy needs to get fired. I'll tell you that much. Um, let's take that for example. So, exactly right. So, when doing something like a static stretch before a game, the problem with that is I'm not going to get too technical on the science side of it, but essentially you're decreasing the overlap of your myosin and actin, which is essentially you're preventing the ability to generate as much force as you normally could have if you warmed up with a dynamic stretch instead. So things like that, I would say not prioritizing your sleep. Mm. That's my number one thing I see a lot is I've got guys, as I said, who would take pre-workout about 6 p.m. at night, 7 (laughs) p.m. at night. No respect. You know what I mean? And then go and train and I go, and these guys, I can't train without pre workout They're just, you yeah, know, yeah, and that's yeah. how they are. And I would say, I would rather you have a shit session or not even train that night mm. as long as you get that good night's rest. Because that's where your body's releasing the testosterone. Yeah. It's releasing the growth hormone. It's actually repairing. I, I just want to touch on that pre-workout one with you. It's like, uh, I've had so many people comment, bro, I can have this pre-workout with 450 milligrams of caffeine three hours before bed and mm. still sleep fine. It's like... Yeah, there's a difference between falling asleep and sleep quality. Like your sleep quality is going to be in the actual gutter. If you yeah. just, I'm pretty sure you don't want more than 50 milligrams of caffeine circulating in your body when you're trying to fall asleep. So you have to kind of obey that half-life. If you're, it's a half-life of five to seven hours. So mm. I would only ever take a serious amount, like 400 milligrams if mm. it's a comp and you know, you need that performance enhancement. Mm. Or if it's like a really early session, like a morning session, then it kind of makes sense. But if you're, 
Like you're going to have a serious amount of caffeine in your system if you're doing that like on a, on a night session. It's too much. Yeah. A quick comment on that where you said about the early session. Have you heard of Andrew Huberman? Yeah, of yeah, course. Of I course. To all yeah. Podcasts. So what he was recommending was giving yourself about a two hour window in the morning yeah. with no caffeine. Mm. Why? That allows the adenosine that's from your, that's pretty much built up in your brain that's made you tired to clear out yeah whereas if you come in and have the caffeine straight away what's going to happen is it's going to block the receptors and keep that adenosine there so then once that caffeine sort of comes down you're going to feel really yeah, shit you're gonna have a crash. You're gonna, yeah you're gonna have a massive crash yeah. so a piece of advice when it does come to caffeine consumption no caffeine within two hours of when you've woken up and then try to limit it to about I would say eight hours before bedtime yeah just quick 100 my think little that's a rules good rule yeah time. my little rules when it comes to that yep Flying lads. All right, next one, Austin.deg says, how do you condition your athletes to stay powerful during the season? Great question, great question. So this comes back to plyometrics, mm. right? Where it's, if you're looking at being powerful, what we do is we implement our plyometric exercises within the beginning of the session while they are still fresh. You don't want to do it after the hypertrophy work because they're going to be a bit pre-fatigued nervous mm. system wise and muscular wise. Um, so I would say my answer to that question is, yeah, just implementing plyometrics appropriately throughout their program um you know all my sessions so the way i structure my programs are a push pull legs with uh two cardio conditioning days during all of those sessions you will have some form of plyometric within every single session um and they're all specific to the movement so for example if it's a push session it's going to be a push plyometric drill so stuff like a med ball ground slam just moving resistance fast whereas if it's lower body then obviously we get our broad jumps in box jumps etc Fantastic. All right, last question is from Liam underscore Hepburn, and I get asked this all the time. I want you to answer it in like, like give us three, you know, one, two, and three. Done. How to get faster. It's very, very simple. Give us three things they can do to get faster at running. Sprint mechanics. Yep. Plyometrics and sprint. Yep. So more sprinting. Yep. So practice, you know what I mean? Love it's that. again, that repetition. It, I always keep going back to that analogy. If you want to get good at something, do it. You want to get good at benching bench. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, that's very simple, but it's... And there's a lot of other ways of going about it, but I would say if you work on the sprint mechanics, you build up your form correctly, like there's actual... There's efficiency in your movement. The plyometrics will provide you with the explosivity and the ability to force generate. And then going into actual sprint form where it's more that top of the pyramid sport specific, yeah. you've ticked all boxes. With the sprinting, I remember in school that there were just like always those kids who may have been a good, like, technically at, like, soccer or footy, mm. but they were just slow as fuck. Yeah, like, they just like turned a like a truck. Up. Me, I wasn't the most skilled soccer player, but I was faster you than anyone. Today. I would beat them for pace. Yeah. Is it possible to mm. teach a slow lorry of a bloke like that? Queen Mary II. Qu yeah, Queen Mary II. <laughs> to, to, be, to be this specimen, be, yeah, eh? <laughs> fast twitch versus slow twitch. Like, what are we talking? Is he just has to respawn, essentially? Like, what's what's wrong with him? There are genetic factors, don't yeah. get me wrong, you know what I mean? Like the disposition of what you actually have in terms of your muscle fibers, are you more like the type 2X, are you more the type 1, you know what I mean? Yeah. We, we obviously have all of them, but some people are stronger in a certain type. I would say the human body is built to be adapted, yeah. you know what I mean? If you provide the correct stresses and the correct um, yeah, challenges to the body, it will adapt appropriately. Mm -hmm. So I think anyone can get fast. Yeah. Anyone can get strong. Anyone can get explosive. Mm. It goes back to progressive overload. Don't go to level 100 and think, yeah, oh, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. Start at level one, two, three, brick by brick. I remember our physio he said to me once, any man, no matter the excuse, should at least be able to run 100 meters in 12 seconds. Mm, I love that. Yeah. It's a, good, it's a very good like, okay, that's a goal I want. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then it goes back to like every man should be able to do 10 chin ups you know yep. what i mean something like that where it's mastering your body weight i think they're really good goals to have mm. because they're functional and they're relatable to your everyday living yep mate great work well that's all we've got if people how can people find you they want to be part of the affinity athletes yeah what, where are we going what are we doing so we've got instagram we've got coach Huey, and we also have our brand affinity athletics We've got TikTok as well with Coach Huey. Um, if you like, you can shoot me an email at info at affinityathletics.co. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting in touch with everyone and hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, mate, 100%. One of our best podcasts, I reckon. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It was honored to have you guys today. Thank Thanks you. Much.